I should like, in my father's centenary year, to tell you something about some of the other music he wrote during his very short life. Several of his early compositions were performed while he was still a student at the Royal College of Music, including his Symphony in A minor and his Clarinet Quintet. And then, in 1898, the year after he left the college, his first great opportunity arose through the kindness of Elgar, who had been invited to write an orchestral work for the forthcoming Three Choirs Festival. On April 17th that year, Elgar sent the following letter from Forley, Malvern, to Herbert Brewer, the organist of Gloucester Cathedral. I have received a request from the secretary to write a short orchestral thing for the evening concert. I'm sorry I'm too busy to do so. I wish, wish, wish you would ask Coleridge Taylor to do it. He still wants recognition and is far away the cleverest fellow going amongst the young men. Please don't let your committee throw away the chance of doing a good act. This resulted in Coleridge Taylor receiving the commission. He wrote the Ballad in A minor, Opus 33, for full orchestra. And after the first performance in the Shire Hall, which he conducted himself in the following September, he received an ovation. The success of the A minor ballad was followed two months later by Hiawatha's Wedding Feast, which was first performed at the Royal College of Music under the direction of Stanford in November 1898. This performance caused something of a sensation, and henceforward Coleridge Taylor's future as a composer was firmly sealed. said that it was the curious names that first attracted him to Hiawatha, but I believe there was also a deeper reason. Vorjak had produced his New World Symphony a few years before, in 1893, and it is known that much of the inspiration for the symphony arose through Vorjak coming across a Czech translation of Longfellow's Song of Hiawatha. My father was a champion of Vorjak and was greatly influenced by his music. It is not unreasonable to suppose, therefore, that the admiration he had for Vorjak's music and his close study of it stimulated his interest in the Hiawatha poem. When asked which part of the wedding feast he liked best, my father indicated the section towards the end, sung by the altos, accompanied by tremolo strings. 
So he told the strange adventures of Oseo, the magician, from the evening star descended. For sheer simplicity, this is very beautiful. I find it very moving. A year after the wedding feast, the second part of the trilogy, The Death of Minnehaha, was performed at the North Staffordshire Festival in Hanley. This contains some of the most skilful writing of all three parts and is a splendid and powerful setting of the drama. Richly scored, the music illustrates Longfellow's description of the long and dreary winter, the famine and the fever, the tragedy of the dying Minnehaha, the sad figure of old Nokomis, the anguish of Hiawatha. Unforgettable is the lament, Wahonomin, Wahonomin, sung first by Nokomis. The third part, Hiawatha's Departure, was now completed and the whole trilogy was first performed by the Royal Choral Society on the 22nd of March 1900. The great finale is indeed full of inspired writing with powerful dramatic qualities. There are, of course, various other choral works by my father which I should like to mention if time permitted but the one I must talk about is his setting of the poem by Alfred Noyes, A Tale of Old Japan. This was written in 1911, a few months only before his death. It showed he had developed a new power of expression and of deep emotion. A Tale of Old Japan received its first performance by the London Choral Society at the Queen's Hall in December 1911. Its success was such that it followed Hiawatha very closely. In fact, Father liked a tale of old Japan better than Hiawatha. He said, the beauty of the poetry and imagery held me and I had to express it musically. I have a special affection for this work, for I remember it very distinctly from the time of its actual composition when, as a child, I stood beside my father at the piano, listening to the music and watching him as he played. He even asked me to sing some of the vocal lines. 
When it came to introducing either the tenor or baritone part, he joined with me in his own voice. In this way, I learned directly from him exactly how the music should be played and sung. Coleridge Taylor's output of orchestral music was very considerable, quite apart from the lighter pieces such as Petite Suite de Concert. His biggest purely orchestral work was the symphonic variations on an African air, which was first performed at a Philharmonic Society concert in the Queen's Hall under the composer's direction in 1906. The music inspired by his three visits to America showed the influence of the change in environment and freedom from personal worries. As a result of these visits, he wrote the orchestral rhapsody from the prairies, the rhapsodic dance Bambula, and the violin concerto in G minor, which are characteristic of the composer at his best. The violin concerto was Coleridge Taylor's last major composition, and he considered that it surpassed any previous work of his. The first performance in this country took place under Sir Henry Wood with Arthur Catterall as soloist at the Queen's Hall in London in 1912, shortly after the composer's death. As one commentator has written, his violin concerto represents him at the height of his powers. This is not a work for the virtuoso soloist, rather it is the entire content shared equally between orchestra and solo violin. Again, we see his masterly use of instruments in the team, strings scored with melodies that haunt the memory, so imbued with beauty as almost to move the listener to tears. It is a mystery that such a work should have been so ignored in the British Concert Hall.